Thank you for joining us for our series in the Gospel of John entitled, There is Hope in Christ, because there is indeed hope in Jesus Christ. In John chapter number 5, we find an identity crisis. Jesus is claiming that he is God, he equates himself with God, and we will be examining his claims in John's Gospel chapter number 5 in the Great Identity Crisis. All right, well again, good morning. Welcome to Ebenezer. And it's a privilege to join together in worship this morning, amen? As we stand next to our brothers and sisters in Christ, there's a lot of religions around this world that are celebrating their religion, but I got to tell you, their leaders' tombs are occupied. You can go to those tombs, and there's people buried there, but we celebrate our Savior, because his tomb is not occupied, because he is alive forever. That tomb is empty, and there's people that have been there to see that tomb that's empty. Amen? All right, let's sing together.
From wherever you've been, come broken hearted, let the rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come kneel. 
Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your the grace there's rest for the weary a rest that endures cause earth has no sorrow that heaven can't Yes, earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for a time of worship, a time to celebrate, even a time to lay our hearts before you, a time to encourage one another, a time to remind even ourselves that we can bring whatever we have before you. As pastor has said, it doesn't matter how many times. We know that you have reached out to us. You have called us by name. You want that relationship with us. You want your creation to come to you with love and compassion. You want us to come to you with all of our cares, with all of our burdens, and yes, even all our failures. 
to restore that relationship. Lord, there is life in who you are. There is life in your name. There is life in everything about you. Lord, help us not to believe in the lies of this world and the formation of everything around us sometimes that leads us astray. But let us believe in the truth. The truth that comes from you and that the truth that brings life that sets us free. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all that you've done for us. And if we do need to lay our lives before you and come however we are and back to the celebration of who you are, if it's distant from us, Lord, let us do it. Let us lay aside those burdens. Let us lay aside all that there is and know that you are good and let us know that we can celebrate who you are in our hearts. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. And uh, if you've got your Bibles, uh, preschoolers are dismissed. Kiddos, you'll stay in here with us today. Trust you got one of the action packs when you came in. If you didn't, they're out at the Welcome Center. If you've got your Bibles, <clears throat> John's Gospel, chapter number five. John chapter number five. We are walking through John's gospel. Uh, we last week looked in John chapter number five and the week before in John chapter number five last week examining the Sabbath in particular because Jesus is accused of breaking the Sabbath as he heals the, the man at the pool of Bethesda, the place of mercy. And now we come to a rather lengthy section from about or verse number 17 all the way down through verse number 47. If you have a red-lettered edition of Scripture, you'll notice that Jesus is doing most of the talking in this particular section of Scripture. This morning, I want to talk about um, the identity crisis uh, because we indeed have an identity crisis going on in our culture and our world. Uh, there are those who are, are wanting to really kind of change and transform uh, the whole idea of who we are. What is our identity? And they're trying to take that and button it whole into one particular area of life and uh, confuse and change everything about uh, not necessarily maybe those of us who are a little bit older, but maybe this coming generation for sure. And in John chapter number five, there's an identity crisis because Jesus is accused of not being who he said that he was and is. Let's, let's read this particular text beginning in verse number 17. But Jesus answered and said unto them, my father worketh and so therefore also I am working because Remember back in uh, verse number 16, they sought to persecute Jesus because he had done these things on the Sabbath day, saying to the man, you know, take up your bed and walk, which by the way, healing was not breaking the Sabbath day. They had just added uh, a bunch to the, to the law of the Old Testament. Therefore, the Jews sought to kill him the more because not only had he broken the Sabbath in their mind, but said that he also was the son of God, that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. For the father loveth the son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, that he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel." For as a father raised up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the son quickeneth whom he will. For the father judgeth no man, but hath committed all things into the judgment of the son. That all men should honor the son, even as they honor the father. He that honoreth not the son, honoreth not the father which he hath sent. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, 
when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they shall hear and they shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, talking about John. And ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witnesses than of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And you have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him you believe not. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do you not think that I accuse you to the Father? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe in my words? A rather lengthy section, and in essence, a, a sermon by Jesus himself. And so we want to talk a little bit this morning about identity. When you think about identity, I'm sure there are several things that come to your mind. One, certainly age determines our identity, right? Right? For those that are maybe 60 and, and above, uh, we are now in the category of old. Can I get a witness for that, all right? <laughs> There's a few that are willing to admit that, all right? You know, if you're, maybe if you're up to the age of, uh, you know, 10 or 11 or 12, or maybe even all the way up to 18, you're considered young, all right? That's kind of, a, that's your identity. And somewhere in the middle, you know, you're thrown around in all kinds of categories, but then there's the identity of ability. Everybody has different abilities. For instance, uh, I would say that, that Melissa is an artist, all right, right? Uh, because she had the ability to create all of this out of cardboard, all right? I, I, it's a good thing that I didn't do this, all right? Because my ability or the lack of my ability would have shown. I, I've been told that really it's not Melissa, it's really Scott who has all the genius, but I'm just told that. And you look around and you go room to room, you go down the hallway and you see all the work that all of the, all of the leaders have done, uh, Heather and Kristen and Morgan and all the groups that were here working. That, that's, that, that's, that's incredible creativity. So there's an identity in, in our abilities. Uh, there's also some identity in our race and ethnicity. Uh, whether we are white or black, whether we're Asian or Indian, whatever that case may be, race and ethnicity determines somewhat our identity. That's who we are. Uh, then there's gender, right? And there are only, by the way, according to God's word, there are only two genders. And those two genders are what, church? Male and female. Because in the beginning, God created them Male and female created he them. That's the end of the story in spite of what you may hear. Uh, and now, now we have uh, thrown into the mix, as we'll talk about just a little bit, 
this whole idea of sexual orientation, right? Because now everybody wants to kind of claim some kind of identity based on sexual orientation. Uh, then there's social economic status. Uh, you know, whether it's poor or rich or uh, if you took any economics in, in school or in college or university, you've got lower, lower, you've got, you've got lower, middle, you've got lower, upper, you've got middle, 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 upper, uh, middle, middle, you know, all the way through all of those economic classes. And so everybody fits into one of those categories uh, and therefore it determines in a lot of respects our identity. Then there's the identity of religion, right? Well, you know, we, most of us, I, I think, would identify one first and foremost as followers of Jesus Christ. If not, I trust that before this day is out that you'll surrender your life to Jesus. And you can identify as a follower of Jesus Christ. We attend a Baptist church. Uh, I am a, a Baptist minister. Therefore, I identify as a what? As a Baptist. Why? Because I believe in its, our missiology. I believe in our polity. And I believe in our doctrine. Therefore, I, that's who, what I adhere to. Does that mean that others are wrong? Not necessarily. That's just who we happen to I identify as. And so you think about your identity. When you think about you and who you are, each and every one of us here today has a very, very clear identity. Now we come to all of the confusion about identity. I, I find this very, very interesting. I, I find this very disconcerting. Uh, I, I find this uh, troubling to say the least. If you go to Planned Parenthood's website, uh, this is uh, one of the articles that you'll find. Sexuality has to do with the way you identify. How you experience sexual and romantic attraction, if you do, and your interest in and preference around sexual and romantic relationships and behavior. Who your sexual or romantic partner is at any given moment in time doesn't de necessarily define this part of who you are. Sexuality can be fluid. By the way, I'm sure if you listen to the news, you've heard that, right? You, we, are, we are now sexually fluid. Changing in different situations for some and over the years for others. Observing patterns in sexual and romantic attraction, behavior, and, and preference over time is one way to better understand your sexual identity or your romantic orientation. Familiarizing yourself with language that describes different types of sexual and romantic feelings and orientations will help you. Your partners and your friends navigate and understand the many ways people experience and identify their sexuality. And by the way, this article that I've got here in my notes has 39, 39 different sexual orientations or identities. I'm a guy, that's who I am, all right? There, 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 are, there are one of two things. You, you're either born with an X or a Y chromosome. There's, there's no undoing that biologically. That's an impossibility because that's the way God created us, and that is our identity. That, that's it, all right? I think it's critical that we say those things. But when you come to the end of that particular article, this is what Planned Parenthood said, which I, I, fi I find very interesting. I thought Planned Parenthood was all about parenthood, not about trying to corrupt the hearts and minds of children in respect to their sexuality. I'm just, I'm a little concerned about that. I realize that may be in a little heavy of a political statement, but it is what it is, so you heard me say it, all right? And here's the bottom line, according to this article. It's okay to feel unsure or overwhelmed by the labels we now have to describe sexual and romantic orientation, attraction, and behavior. Expanding the language you use to describe your sexuality can provide important guidance, validation, and access to community while your journey of sexual self-discovery and satisfaction continue and go on. You say, wow. Wow. Is that really the world in which we live? And to which I say to you, yes, it is the world in which we live in. 
And, and it's very disturbing to say the least. Because here, here's the truth of the matter when it comes to identity. First and foremost, our identity must be in who Jesus Christ is. You see, if, if we identify in who Christ is, then that clears up all the other things. Because then, if I identify in who Jesus is and who he says he is, then I'm going to identify and I'm going to believe in what the Word of God says. And the Word of God is that truth manual for how we should live our lives and how we should identify. Now, does that mean that we go around uh, beating up and bashing people because uh, they're confused about things? No, not at all. That simply means this. If I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, I need to simply speak the truth in love and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, trusting and hoping that will transform the heart and the mind and leave the work up to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, because you or I will never, ever change anyone. And so this morning, we come to this particular text in John chapter number 5, this, this kind of this diatribe, this back and forth between Jesus and the religious leaders about his identity and who he says he is. Remember, they, they, were, they were incredibly furious with him because he had according to their law, healed on the Sabbath. But then he says this, in verse number 17, he said this. He said, my father, my father. He didn't say our father. He said, my father works, and guess what? So do I continue to work. They were then infuriated with him. Why? Because he had at that moment declared that he was God. He made a clear identity statement. Uh, in, in this particular text, I, I believe we find a great theological text. When we think about theology, you know, theology is divided in, into a number of, of realms. Theology is the study of God. Then you've got things like ecclesiology, the study of the church, and eschatology, the study of end times, pneumatology, uh, the study of the Holy Spirit, and bibliology, the study of Scripture, and uh, harmatiology, the study of sin, and Christology. If, if there were, I think maybe in all of Scriptures, one of the great Christology texts, it would be this text this morning in John chapter 5, beginning in verse number 17, going all the way down through verse number 47. Dr. Ivor Powell said this, he said that the quest for material, and I quote, the preacher can tend to lean toward the historical narratives because the stories are conducive to reproduction. The scenes at the Jordan that we read about early in John's gospel, the wedding at Cana and changing the, the water into wine, the interview with Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman at the well, and even the healing that we just read about two weeks ago of the impotent man uh, there at the pool of Bethesda, he said, provide wonderful sermon material. He says this, he said, however, we must be aware, and I've heard Dr. Powell preach a number of times, he's now dead, and he was one of the great expositors of scripture uh, that I ever sat under. He said, we must be aware, however, at being drawn irresistibly to stories in scripture. He said, the most important part of John's gospel are found not in the deeds of Jesus, but in his sermons. Don't miss that. He said, the most important things in John's gospel are not his deeds, but his sermons. You see, a lot of times, uh, we, we often find ourselves just like the ones that Jesus is kind of bantering with. We like the spectacular, do we not? I, I, man, yeah, to see the dead raised, to see the water turned into wine, to see all of this wonderful stuff is great and glorious. But don't miss the sermons. Because in Jesus' sermons, we find out who he is. And if we do not clearly understand 
and cannot clearly defend who he is, then we have nothing. Don't miss that. We have absolutely nothing. And so this morning, I want us to begin in verse number 17, and I want us to see several things. Uh, We'll probably only get through part of this today, which is perfectly fine. We're going to see that Jesus declares his identity. And and then the second part of this text uh, that begins in verse number 31, we find some witnesses that declare his identity. So first of all, Jesus' own declaration of his identity. In verse number 17, he says, my father works. And guess what? I am likewise working. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 3, the Bible says this, that the Father upholds everything by his power. That means this, that God is constantly at work. God doesn't stop. Aren't you glad for that, church? I mean, he, he doesn't stop. And so Jesus is saying, I want you to know this. God is at work, constantly at work, and I am constantly at work. As a matter of fact, uh, as he describes uh, in Matthew's gospel, chapter number 12 and verse number 8, he said, as we examined last week, I am, Jesus said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. So therefore, I am over everything. So what I am doing, what you just saw me do, I have the full right and ability to do because I am God. I am constantly at work doing exactly what the Father would have me to do. And that's exactly what you and I should be doing. As someone said it this way, I I shared this on Wednesday night, if you listen to our Bible study, if God is always at work, then why are we always worrying? If God is always at work, then why do we find ourselves always worrying? My father works, I work. Then in verses 18 and 19, he says, My father acts, and I act. Whatever he does, that's exactly what I am going to do. As a matter of fact, in in John chapter 1 and verse number 3, my father created, right? And guess what? I created. In John chapter 1 and verse 3, we were there uh, many, many weeks ago. You remember exactly what John records in John 1, 3? All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus says, listen, the Father acts, I act. The Father created, I create. But then in verse number 21, he says this, my Father raises the dead, and guess what? I likewise can do what? I can raise the dead. Now, don't miss it, because at this point, guess what? He had not yet raised anybody physically from the dead. So what is Jesus talking about here when he says, my father raises from the dead, I can raise from the dead? It's both spiritual and it's physical. Because at one time, we were all dead in trespasses and sin. And guess what Jesus did? And Jesus and Jesus alone, guess what he did? He raised us all spiritually from the dead. We know a little bit later in John's gospel, guess what he's going to do? He's going to go to the tomb of Lazarus. And what is he going to do? He's going to say, Lazarus, what? Come forth. And he is going to raise the dead physically. But Jesus is saying, listen, I want you to know whatever God does, I can do the same. I can absolutely give life where there is absolutely no life at all. And then in verse number 22, he says, listen, the father judges. I judge. We're going to come back to that in just a minute because there's several other verses that point to the fact that he judges. And then he says also, remember, he said, listen, the father is honored and therefore I am honored in verse number 23, that all men should honor the son even as they honor the father. He that honoreth not the son honoreth not the father which hath sent him. Now, remember who he's talking to. Remember the crowd that he's talking to. He's talking to Jewish religious leaders who knew the Old Testament inside and out. Uh, They were indeed God followers. They weren't Jesus followers. And Jesus is simply saying, listen, I want you to know, you're not honoring me. So because you're not honoring me, you are not honoring the Father. And you can only imagine as Jesus is going through his sermon with those religious leaders, the fury 
is rising and rising and rising and rising. Uh, They're getting more angry and more angry and more angry at his, according to them, his preposterous claims to be equal with God. Listen, listen, church. If Jesus is not God, we have absolutely nothing. There are a lot of people who make this claim. Well, Jesus, a lot of false religions, a lot of cults that say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. This is one text in particular that they have an extraordinary difficult time with. If Jesus is not God, then what do we have, church? What do we have? We have nothing. Uh, you know what? This, this week, we're going we're gonna to teach to our children. I'm looking over here on the signs, on the banners. I am the resurrection and the life, John eleven twenty five. 25. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Matthew chapter 8 and verse 27. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. John 6, 47 and 48. I am the light of the world. John chapter 8 and verse 12. Hey, listen, if Jesus is not all of that, I've got bad news for all of you who spent all this time decorating and putting up these foolish posters. Let's just tear them down after church is over with. Let's all just go home. There's no need for us to continue to meet as we do on every Sunday morning if Jesus is not God. And that must be a continual, continual heart cry. And that must be the continual a mouthpiece of all that we say that Jesus is God. He must be exalted above everything else. Or we have absolutely, completely nothing at all. It's interesting what Jesus says over in Matthew's gospel, chapter number 9, verses 1 through 8. In Matthew chapter number 9, verses 1 through 8. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city to Capernaum. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of palsy lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Notice what he says in verse number two. What does he say? Thy what? Thy sins be forgiven. Thy sins be forgiven. You see, Jesus is saying this in John chapter number five. My father forgives sins. Guess what? I forgive sins. If Jesus cannot forgive sins, then guess what, church? We are all still what? In our sins. We're in deep trouble. Jesus is saying, my father is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, and so am I. Uh, throughout the Gospel of John, we, we know these seven sayings well. We'll come to them as we walk through John's Gospel. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and life. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the sheep. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the true vine. That's what Jesus is declaring as he walks through this sermon. We come to verse number 24 and notice what Jesus says next. My father gives eternal life and I give eternal life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. The Apostle Paul affirms that in Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but are walking after the Spirit. I want you to know in Christ we are no longer condemned by our sin. Amen? Man, that's, that's incredible. That's, that's a great joy. That's a great privilege to know that we are that in Christ. Christ. And then Jesus says this in verses 25 through 29 in our text. He says, my father gives resurrection life and I am the giver of resurrection life. And, and there are four kinds of resurrection life, if you will, that he outlines in these four or five verses. The first thing he says in verse number 25, 
is verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming. Now, don't miss this. And now is. It's not talking about future. He's talking about right now. And now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and that they shall indeed live. You see, here's what Jesus said I can do. I can give spiritual resurrection life for the sinner right now. The second thing that he says in verse number 26 is this. He says, I have life because I will one day lay down my life, but I will take my life up. He says, the Father has not only given me the ability uh, to, to raise those who are sinners and dead in their sins to resurrection life, but I one day will lay down my life and I will raise my life back up again. Now go to John chapter number two. John chapter two. Jesus makes this very declaration in verse number 19. Of course, the religious leaders didn't know who he was talking about or what he was talking about. They thought he was talking about a physical building. He was talking about himself. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, speaking of himself, and in three days, what will I do? I will do what? Raise it up again. Go to chapter number 10. John chapter number 10, verses 17 and 18. Jesus says this, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received from my Father. You see, Jesus was consistent in what he said about who he was. There was no doubt what he knew his identity was, that he indeed was God. And then in verses 28 and 29 of our text, notice the next kind of resurrection life, if you will, that he gives. In verse 28 of John 5, marvel not at this time for the hour is coming, that's future, what he talked about earlier has already come and is happening, but now this is something future, marvel not for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Talking about, by the way, his own voice, the voice of Christ. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. I, I want you to know this. That if tomorrow, if tomorrow you die and we bring your body right here and we say our goodbyes and we weep and we cry over you, or maybe not, but if we do, And we take you across the street if you're buried at Ebenezer and we dig a hole in the ground and we put you in the ground and your body continues to rot away just as it is right now already. And uh, your body rots away and it turns back into nothing but dust. I want you to know there is coming a day when the voice of Jesus will be heard and the dead in Christ will rise again. Wow. I say, how is that possible? Listen, if Jesus is not God, then guess what's going to happen? We're going to take you across the street. We're going to put you in the ground. And there's where you're going to be forever. But that's not what the Bible says. And that's not who Jesus is. Go, go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Familiar passage. Familiar. But it's worth listening to. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse number 50, now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. First, first Corinthians 15, 50, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I will show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be what? Come on, changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. What? incorruptible. That means when we are raised from the dead because of the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will go on living forever and ever and ever and ever. Wow. Now, now go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4.
1 Thessalonians 4. Verse number 13. But I would not have you to be unlearned or ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep or those that have died, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. But listen, when we die, we have no reason to sorrow, right? I mean, we might cry, and that's natural, that's normal. But we have, listen, we have every reason to rejoice when we are in Christ. Why is that? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which have died in Christ will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which have died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, Hey! It'll be louder than that, all right? I just woke some of you all up, all right? I mean, can, I, can't, can you, I can't imagine what that will be like. I mean, this is, we're talking about a voice that will be heard around the globe. It's the voice that, John's, that John is recording that Jesus is talking about back in chapter number 5. He says, listen, when they hear the voice of the Son, guess what? Up from the grave we will come. Wow, man, that's, ex- that's exciting. That ought to be exciting. Maybe not for you. Okay, hallelujah. (laughs) Enjoy enjoy that. Enjoy that vault. All right. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore do what? Comfort one another, encourage one another with these very words. Listen, this is not all there is. Wow, man. So Jesus is saying, listen, I have have resurrection power. Spiritual resurrection life for the sinner now. Life in myself. Resurrection power for me from the grave. Resurrection to life for the believer in the future. Oh, but wait a minute. Then he says this in verse 28 and 29b. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. All, listen, don't miss that. Circle that. All that are in the graves. Those of us who know Christ, we will hear his voice. You say, how can we hear his voice if we are dead? I don't know. I figure God can take care of that. But wait a minute. Not only those who are in Christ, but notice what he says. And shall come forth they that have done good unto resurrection of life, and they that have done what? Evil. Those who are apart from Christ, unto the resurrection of damnation. That means this. There's coming a day, listen carefully, there's coming a day when what we just read in 1 Corinthians 15 And 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 is going to happen. It could be today, right? It could be at any moment, at any time. I believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. But when that voice is heard, listen carefully. If you are apart from Christ, if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, one of two things are going to happen to you. One, if you're already dead, you will be raised to live again, to be in torment forever. If you're still alive, guess what? You'll go up again to be in torment forever. That's what, that's what Scripture is saying. I, I, I would say this as clearly as I can possibly say it to you. If you have not surrendered your life to Christ, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about attending a Baptist church or whatever church it may be whatever your religious identity may happen to be. I'm talking about identifying with the person of Jesus Christ, having fully and completely surrendered your life to him. That's what it is. It's not about a think so. It's not about a hope so. It's not about, well, maybe I am. Uh, I, I think I've done enough good. No, you have never done enough good, and you never will do enough good. None of us can do enough good. One day, one day, 
you're going to hear his voice. And one day, you're going to spend an eternity in heaven, or you're going to spend an eternity in a place called hell. See, Jesus says, the Father has resurrection life, I have resurrection life. We'll conclude with this. And Jesus says in verse 22, 27, and verse number 30, he says, The Father has given all judgment into my hand. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment into the Son. Verse 22. Verse 27. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing as I hear. I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Say, so what, what, what kind of judgment are we talking about? There's two judgments. There's two judgments. Everybody in this room, everybody in this room, no one will miss out on one of these two. Not a single solitary person. One is called the judgment seat of Christ or the bema seat as the Greeks would have called it. The bema seat is a place where you would be judged and given rewards or rewards would be withheld. And, and we find that recorded uh, in two places. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. You love it when you pick the wrong. It's 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Beginning in verse number 12. Now, if any man build upon the foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire." You see, there's coming a day when as followers of Jesus Christ, we will all stand before the judgment seat of, of Christ. And, and we will be judged. Not, not because of our sin, by the way. The sin judgment already took place at the cross. We're not going to stand before Christ being judged for sin, but we're, we're going to stand before Christ being judged for what we have done with what we have been given. To whom much is given, Scripture reminds us, much is required. If you've been a follower of Christ for a long time, you've got a lot to account for. I had this conversation with somebody recently. He made this statement to me. He said, man, I, I wish I had surrendered my life to Christ a long time ago. I, I've got so much to make up for. I said, no, you, you can't make up for that. And by the way, before you came to Christ, you're not accountable for those things. But from this time forward, you're accountable. We're all going to give an account. We, we, don't, we don't like to give an account for anything because we're all very independent. But one day we will stand before Christ and we'll give an account for everything that we've done. Everything that we've done. Every deed we've done, every word we've said, all of those things looking to and pointing to our service for him. If they were of the wrong motives, if they were for selfish reasons, or if we didn't do them at all, then guess what? Rewards will be withheld. If on the other hand, they were done as, as a result of the right motive, 
and we have been faithful at doing those things, then we will be rewarded accordingly. That's what Scripture says. There is coming a day when we will be judged and we will be rewarded or those rewards will be withheld. But then there's a second judgment. Revelation chapter number 20. In verse number 11. The Bible says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in his books according to his work. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was, was cast where? Was cast into the lake of fire. See, Jesus says this. He says, I want you to know this. My father and I are one. Don't ever mistake that. He's honored, I'm honored. He judges, I judge. He gives resurrection life, I have resurrection life. He gives eternal life, I give eternal life. Everything that he is, I am. That's why when he said those words, I am, it infuriated the religious leaders. So one of two things this morning. One, you either firmly, absolutely, and completely believe who Jesus is and who he is and his identity, or you do not. You've either completely trusted your life into his hands and his work, or you have not. One day, however, one day, however, if you do not, the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. I wonder, do you believe? Jesus is clearly declaring his identity. Are, are you really clear on the identity of Jesus Christ? a great book by uh, Josh Mc McDowell entitled Evidence That Demands a Verdict. You know, there's, there's a lot of evidence in the world. What's your verdict? There's evidence in Scripture. What's your verdict? Is Jesus really God? Is he? I trust you're clear on his identity. Would you bow your heads? Would you just quietly stand to your feet? I wonder this morning how many of us would be willing to say, yep, yep I, I am absolutely certain in respect to the identity of Jesus Christ. And secondly, I have identified with him because I have trusted everything that I am, all that I am, into his life and his hands. I've surrendered my all to Jesus Christ. I, I wonder this morning, how many might just as a testimony before the Lord, might just raise your hand and say, yep, that's me. I identify with who he is. He is mine and I am his. I wonder this morning if there's anyone who would say, you know, I've never fully put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 
I've never really identified with him, but today I, I want to I identify with Christ. I want to surrender my life to Christ. Is there anyone today that that's your desire, that's your, that's your prayer? God, I want to identify with you through your son, Jesus. If so, I, I would just ask you maybe just to come and meet me right here. Not, not going to make a spectacle. Maybe someone will take you aside and just open God's word and show you about knowing who Jesus is. Or, or maybe this morning for you, it's someone that you know, you know has never clearly identified with Christ and you're burdened for that person. And maybe this morning you would come and you would just get on your face before God and lift up their name before the Lord and say, oh God, I, I pray that this person, this person, and this person, oh God, that they would find their identity in you. Father, thank you for the privilege of knowing you through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that Jesus is not just another man, another prophet, and somebody who did some good things, but he is indeed God. And he's provided for us a means and a way to have a personal relationship with you. And one day we are going to hear his voice. If we're alive, we'll go up. If we're dead, we'll go up spend eternity forever in your glorious presence. Thank you for who Jesus Christ is. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. This is Pastor Steve. Again, thank you for joining us for our continuing series in the Gospel of John. There is hope in Christ. There indeed is a hope in Christ. There seems to be an identity crisis in our culture today. We're not sure who we are. But I want us all to know that in Christ, there is a clear and sure identity. I trust that you have your identity rooted, grounded, and a clear foundation in the person of Jesus Christ. If not, I would ask you today, uh, what will you do with Jesus Christ? His claims to say he is indeed God and he provided the means and the way for us to have eternal life. I would encourage you to look at those claims and ask yourself the question, is my identity in Jesus Christ?